Good morning, Church. It is a blessing to be able to open God's Word today. My name is Andrew. I'm the minister at St. Stephen's Presbyterian Church at Flemington. Uh, we have started our service back to normal. It, there's one service at 10 a.m. We would love to see you there. Uh, please let me know if you're interested in coming. You can look at the links down below. We have a Facebook or website, email address, and a phone number for you to contact. We would love to see you gather physically. Um, but otherwise, you can still listen to our sermons online. We're looking at John chapter 1, verse 32 to 34. This is, this is the third part of a three-sermon uh, series on John the Baptist's witness. Uh, we're thinking about Christmas, and today's sermon titles, Life-Changing Christmas in the Son of God. Let me pray and commit this time to God in prayer. God, our Father, we need your help right now as we study your word, especially as we, as we read it and think about it, Lord. Oh, we pray that you would open our ears Open our ears, enable us to hear, open our eyes so that we can see the truth of your word. Father, be transforming people's hearts by the power of your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I'm going to read it. John chapter 1, verse 32 to 34. And John bore witness, I saw the spirit descend from heaven like a dove and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, he on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I've seen and borne witness that this is the Son of God. John chapter 1, verse 32 to 34, life-changing Christmas and the Son of God. That was God's word. Well, have you ever had a life-changing Christmas? Uh, we wouldn't generally consider, consider Christmas to be a life-changing day. Or you might say your wedding day was life-changing when you met your wife or your husband. Maybe you'd say the birth of your child was life-changing. Maybe you'd say getting the dream job or promotion was life-changing. What makes all those things life-changing? 
is life-changing because it changes the course of your future, what your life looks like forever. Uh, life will never be the same when, when I got married to Graham. And life will never be the same when my son Ezra was born. It changes my future. It changes my life forever. Christmas is indeed not life-changing. If Christmas is all about presents, Santa Claus, and meeting with family and friends. However, Christmas is life-changing. I think it is life-changing. It is life-changing because God sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to this earth on Christmas. And He changes the course of history and He brings new hope, new joy, true joy, true hope, true peace in Himself. He brings new life and freedom in Him. It's a life-changing Christmas in the Son of God. Uh, This morning we come to our final point in our three-part sermon on John the Baptist's witness. Two weeks ago, we saw John the Baptist point forward to the fact that Jesus is the anointed one of God. Remember, Jesus is the Christ. He's the Messiah. What that means is he's the anointed one of God. He's the Savior. And everyone is looking forward to him. But he beats, he doesn't meet all expectations. Last week we saw that John the Baptist declared Jesus Christ to be the Lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world. That tells us primarily what Jesus came to do. He came to save. We saw the Ethiopian eunuch, do you remember? He encountered this truth, reading Isaiah 53 about Jesus. And immediately he gets baptized because he wants Jesus. He wants Jesus. He knows what it means for Jesus to be the Lamb of God. And today we look at the final point, the final declaration of who Jesus is. He is the Son of God. Jesus, the Son of God. Look at verses 32 to 34 with me. And John bore witness. I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. John the Baptist recounts and witnesses the baptism of Jesus. He saw the Holy Spirit descend from heaven like a dove onto Jesus. That's what it says in verse 32, doesn't it? In verse 33, it tells us that John the Baptist recounts God's calling for him to prepare the way for Jesus. John baptizes him with water, but the one whom the Holy Spirit descends and remains on him, he will baptize with the Holy Spirit. And so you can see John standing there. He sees the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove upon Jesus, remaining on Jesus. And he says this, He truly is the Son of God. Verse 34, And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. Who is this? This is Jesus. John saw Jesus with new eyes, through new eyes. This is the Son of God who takes away the, who is the Lamb of God who has come to take away the sin of the world. Jesus has come to take away the sin of the world. He is the Son of God. God's Son. Wow. This is a life changing time, a life changing experience, a life changing encounter. John did not fully get it until he saw this. Now he gets it. How will God save sinners? How will people's lives be completely transformed? He'll save them by giving his one and only son. Wow. I want you to ponder and think about that for a second. What does it mean for Jesus to be the son of God? Jesus is the son of God. God the creator, God the maker, God the sustainer, the king of the universe has sent his one and only precious son to earth. I want you to imagine the most arrogant person you know, 
the proudest person you know. Now imagine them humbling themselves before you and serving you. Imagine the most arrogant, rude, proud person giving his life for you. I wonder what person you thought of. Maybe you're thinking of um, Donald Trump. Maybe you're thinking of some communist leader. Maybe you're thinking about your husband or your wife or someone at church. I want you to imagine, imagine them serving you and dying for you. The thing about arrogant and proud people is that they believe that they are always right and they are number one, don't they? The difference between God and proud people is God is king. He is creator. And guess what? He has come down to save you. The incarnation God in the flesh is one of the greatest mysteries in the world. But he did it. How come? Why has Christ come to the earth? Well, God has ordained that John to baptize with water, hasn't he? John's baptism of water and message prepared people for the coming of Jesus. The Son of God is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. The coming of Christ, the Son of God, points us to a passage like Ezekiel 36. Ezekiel 36, verse 25 to 27, talks about a time where God would give new hearts and a new spirit to his people. Verse 26 to 27, And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. Ezekiel was looking forward to a time where God will renew his people. He's looking to a time where God's people will be radically different. Jesus baptizing with the Spirit is proof that the promised time has come. In Jesus, the new covenant has come. How will people have new lives? How will people have a new relationship with God? How will God's people live obedient to God? and radically different to others. It is through the one who gives a new heart and new spirit in believers. It will be through the son who baptizes in the spirit. Jesus is the one through whom we are initiated into God's kingdom and family through receiving the life of God, the Holy Spirit. It is through Jesus, the son of God, that we are born again. And it's Jesus who after his death and resurrection and ascension, who will send the third person of the Trinity into the hearts of believers. John chapter 7 verse 39. Now this is, he said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive it. For as yet the Spirit has now been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. In Acts chapter 1 verse 5. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So what does that mean? What does the Bible say when it, what it means to be a Christian? You see, a Christian is not someone who merely comes to church. Just because you come to church doesn't make you a Christian. A Christian is not someone who merely says that they are a Christian. A Christian is not someone who is merely on the membership roll. A Christian is someone who has been given a new heart and a new spirit. That's what the text says. A Christian is someone who has been radically transformed by God. Transformed. Listen to Ezekiel again. And I will give you a new heart. Not I might. I might perhaps. I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. He will soften hearts. He will change hearts. And I will put my spirit within you. And what? Look at the end of verse 27 of Ezekiel 36. And cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. You see, the Christian is completely transformed, radically transformed. There is no such thing as a Christian who is not transformed. 
The evidence of a believer is someone who has been completely transformed by Jesus Christ. It begins by repentance and belief. That is what John the Baptist preached about, right? He preached, repent for the kingdom of God is near. Believe. You see, it begins with repentance and belief and continues through ongoing sanctification, ongoing Christian living, ongoing holiness. And guess what? That's what Jesus Christ has come to do. He has come to call people to himself. He has come to change people's lives. Have you been transformed by Jesus? Have you been transformed by the Holy Spirit? God himself in the flesh, the Son of God has come to die for you. He has come to change your life. He has come to free you from pride, from selfishness, from arrogance, from greed, from anger, from addiction. In fact, all of your sins, he has come to bring freedom. He has come to set sinners free, God's Son. And guess what? If you're a Christian, Jesus the Son has not left you alone. He baptizes with the Holy Spirit, and that means that if you know Jesus, you are a child of God. God has changed your heart. He has enabled you to see spiritual truth. He has enabled you to see His glory. He has empowered you today by the power of the Holy Spirit to live for Him. He is working His purposes through you. If you are a Christian today, your life will be radically different. Because the Holy Spirit's living in, with you, in you. When the world gets depressed, when the world feel, goes down, the Christian is uplifted and strengthened because they have the Holy Spirit living in them. And you can be sure that He will never leave you or forsake you. You see, the Son of God, Jesus, baptizes with the Spirit. And you can have full confidence in whatever situation you are in because the Spirit now lives in you. If you are a Christian, there is no excuse not to be able to grow in your knowledge of Jesus Christ and His Word because the Holy Spirit enlightens believers. He opens ears, opens eyes. He changes hearts. If you are a Christian, there's no excuse to battle sin. Sin is tempting. It's tempting to get angry. It's tempting to be proud. proud. It's tempting to be angry. But the Holy Spirit's living in you and waging war with the flesh and this world's desires. Do you believe this? Do you believe that if you're a Christian, the Son of God has given you the Spirit and it's living in you? He is living in you. What that means is that the Spirit will be changing you to live life for Jesus He will convict you of sins. He will soften your hearts. He will strengthen you with hope and peace. Praise be to the Lord for Jesus, the Son of God, who comes to give new life in Him. You see, Christmas is life-changing in the Son of God. He brings new life. I want to end by reading our Philippians passage because Philippians 2 gives us the application of what it means for Jesus Christ to be the Son of God. Philippians 2 verse 3 to 11. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Wow, that's a hard thing to do. Count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So that in the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Wow. Jesus' incarnation, 
the fact that we worship the Son of God should challenge us to think and live radically different. There's no room for pride and arrogance in the Christian life. Christians need to be marked with humility. And you can only be marked with humility if you understand the Savior's humility. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. God's Son came down to save you. What a humble thing to do. Has the cross of Christ, the Son of God, changed your life? He died for you. Has the cross of Christ, the Son of God, changed the way you deal with your husband or your wife, your children, your brothers or sisters, your friends, your neighbors, your fellow church members? Every time you talk to them, every time you think about them, has the cross of Christ changed the way you talk to them and act towards them? See, I pray that we would be a church marked with humility. I pray that we would be a people of God who looks to Jesus every day. I pray that we would be brothers and sisters in Christ who are wowed by the fact that God himself would dare to die for our sins. What a wondrous mystery that is. Don't take the cross of Christ for granted. Look to Jesus and be amazed by his death for you. And maybe this morning, maybe this day, whenever you're listening to this sermon, maybe you haven't gotten it. Maybe you've been church, you've been to church since you were young and you have never really gotten it. Maybe today you look at your life and you think, hang on, my life doesn't look like Philippians 2. My life doesn't feel radically different. You need to repent and believe and look to Jesus. Jesus will change your life, 100%. And I pray that you would have eyes to see, ears to hear, a heart which is softened by the Spirit. I pray that you'd be able to see. And if you have any questions or concerns, I would love to talk to you more after the service. I pray that you would humble yourself before the foot of the cross, that you would see Jesus, the Son of God, who is the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Christmas is life-changing in the Son of God. He has come to die for you and to give you new life in Him. Amen. Let's pray. Our God, our Father, we, we love you so much. We give you praise. We give you thanks. We're thankful for your Son who died on the cross to take away the sins of the world. He has come to give new life in Him. He has come to change our hearts, change our spirits to open our eyes, to open our ears, to see your beauty and glory. Father, we pray for those who don't know you yet, who are struggling with sin. We pray that you would soften them and change them, help them to be radically different by the power of your Spirit. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Christ alone.